share my screen first. So obviously, uh, I assume that everyone uh, present knows where Mustang is within the context of uh, Nepal uh, in uh, the, the part that is called Western Nepal here uh, and north of the two large mountain ranges of Annapurna and Dalagiri. And so it's a relative end along the, the Kalikandaki uh, river. And obviously it's a relatively remote area that is of course famed by uh, trekkers uh, for uh, traveling there, at least was until very recently. This is a depiction or, or a picture of uh, 2010 where the tracking path was essentially fully active, uh, but in the meantime, uh, everything can be reached by road. Uh, and uh, yeah, goal, the usual goal is Lomantang, the fortified city that goes back to the 15th century and the Mustang Kingdom. And uh, it's uh, kind of the, my, I was personally only the first time in uh, Mustang and Lomantang in 2010. And one of the kind of surprising aspects of that visit was that in quite contrary to Ladakh, uh, the monasteries had many, many objects on display. And what particularly struck me at that time was at uh, Namgyal Monastery, the so-called Lamjelakan, which was essentially within the monastic quarter, a little temple that was uh, kind of full of sculptures, uh, mostly papier mache sculptures. And those are the ones that actually, or the smaller ones, stand here in the foreground of uh, the main altar. Yeah, And those were collected in one room. Uh, but also in every altar in the different monasteries in Mustang, there's quite an abundance in uh, collections of bronzes. And at that time, I didn't really uh, yet pay attention to the books, but uh, even the, the bookshelves are full of this larger format books, which of course have the potential of being of interest. Uh, the only thing that was uh, clear from the outset is that in, in the interior of monasteries, tourists were not allowed to photograph. <laughs> and obviously, I wasn't allowed to photograph in 2010 either. But in 2012, I went back uh, to essentially start a project that I'm still continuing that uh, was essentially designed to break this vicious circle, namely the circle of uh, photography being used to commission thefts <laughs> uh, with the result that objects get hidden or photography prohibited, uh, both of them, uh, which also means that if objects get stolen or disappear, that they have no proof of ownership. <laughs> and so since there is no proof of ownership, they also can't get these objects back. And to break that kind of vicious circle, documentation is necessary. And that again, in turn, needs photography. Accordingly, uh, having a chance to photograph monastery collections in Mustang was uh, kind of a difficult task to get uh, permission for. But it is the more important as Mustang changes rapidly. And this is a picture of 2019 near summer when the road that was already completed and we see in the background uh, was started to be expanded to a uh, a two, two or even three lane uh, road. Uh, and generally the, the connection via 
Mustang uh, was essentially the, or is being developed as an alternative route towards China. Uh, as as uh, Nepal is quite dependent on, on those connections as well. And this, of course, was one of the results of the blockade of the Indian border uh, for a considerable period in, I think, early 2019. And so getting access to monastery collections was difficult, but the first uh, monastery that actually allowed access was surprisingly Namgyal Monastery, which was probably the least known of all the collections because nobody else uh, got access to first. Uh, the Namgyal Monastery is very close to Lomantang. On this picture, we'll see Lomantang on the right side, Namgyal Monastery on the left on the hill, but it's in a different district. It's in Tsunop and it's independent of Lomantang. And uh, it's a Ngor uh, monastery, Sumor school uh, monastery. And it has a very enterprising uh, Kenpo who essentially uh, yeah, changed a lot in and around Namgil monastery and eventually uh, changed the entire monastery as well. And what looked in 2010 like this, uh, looked in 2016 like this. The entire monastery was uh, by that time deconstructed and in the process of rebuilding, including the old temple. And it is this is uh, essentially under the leadership of uh, Kempo Tsevang Liktsin, who, uh, yeah, as I said, is very enterprising and who is, of course, also responsible for initially providing access to the collection there. And so eventually in 2012, I got the permission to photograph the collection in situ. So just as it is here, uh, through the glass, <laughs> uh, the, the different sculptures and through the first pictures weren't very good. But it is very clear while uh, Tibetan monasteries have inventories, they don't actually know very much about uh, the objects they have in terms of you know, histor history, value, value, and so on, except for some of the main images or some of the, the objects that they use on a daily basis. In terms of inventorying, what they do is mostly counting the images, sometimes identifying them, at least as an image of Manjushri or something like that. But there is no real yeah, assessment in, in the way of age, for example. So one Manjushri sculpture could easily be exchanged by another one. And that is, of course, what happened. Uh, he's kind of in the process of gaining objects for the art market that uh, dealers offered new images for old broken images <laughs> to be able uh, to sell them, for example. The process of documentation at every monastery is a, quite an interesting one because it's also a process for the monks or the Kempo in this case to learn about their objects or to see them close. Uh, and that was one of the interesting experiences. Uh, what the project does, it's simply kind of de-dusting them, uh, measuring the objects, and then photographing them comprehensively from all sides uh, to uh, create an inventory for the respective uh, monasteries. And uh, with and also providing, of course, all the photography so that the, the monastery, even from the first year of documentation, has a record of what they actually have in a quality that is, is high enough to uh, surface proof if something should happen to the objects. And uh, which is not that unlikely given that some of them have a real high market value today. 
and I often show this Kabai Shravana from Namigel Monastery, which I think is so unique and unusual that it would fetch quite a high price on the Western market uh, in the range of yeah several hundred thousand dollars, uh, according to the current uh, market rates. As said, besides the, the sculptures and other precious objects that uh, the monastery may choose, we also looked at books in Namgyal Monastery. And altogether, I have now surveyed most of 11 collections, only of some of them the books uh, to some extent. And uh, it resulted in so far about 2,000 objects recorded on some 44,000 photographs. Of course, the, this huge amount of uh, uh, photographs is mostly due to the manuscript collection or book collection at uh, Namgyal that took along uh, kind of 32,000 photographs because the two 14th century text collections that I have now published together with Marcus Feedback, uh, those alone are, yeah, take a huge part and were documented page by page. And so one of the, the issues I have currently is that it's, yeah, it's a huge amount of, of material and it's a huge amount of work and uh, there, are, there are many, many implications and uh, I do have to uh, kind of re uh, apply for funding uh, to get help in working on the collection. So what, it, what I wanted to focus uh, today on is essentially the question, what do we learn from the interrelationship of these different collections? Because one of the, and to demonstrate that on the basis of different examples, one of the, the interesting aspects of uh, that work is of course that by essentially documenting across different collections, uh, collections may, yeah, you may discover things that you uh, kind of may not expect from the outset. Obviously, a, a kind of prominent part of all collections is what dates uh, to the activities in the 15th and early 16th century of the Mustang Kingdom uh, by supporting in uh, the Ngoa school, the sub-school of the Sakya, and in particular, uh, Ngojen uh, Kunga Zangpo, uh, and kind of allowing him to establish the school uh, in the region. And so there are quite a few, but actually not that many, many portraits of Ngojen himself, as this one uh, that is found in uh, Gami Monastery, or the following one in Song Monastery here that matches kind of iconographically with another uh, image of Murchen that is today in a private collection, but may also have originally come from Mustang and is actually or has been attributed by Imi Heller to Mustang. What is interesting in uh, respect to the sculptural heritage that we have from that early period is a is or there, there are several aspects of it it's the extremely high quality but then that uh, quite a considerable part uh, preserves complete sets in uh, very high quality and of course the the high one of the highlights uh, of the namgil collection are 17 of probably original 24 sculptures of a laundry set that was commissioned by Tsewang Sangpo, a minister of Mustang. And uh, depicts uh, the, the, the laundry teachers. Actually, the uh, Tsewang Sangpo probably made two other sets at least. One of them 
uh, is my assumption is that that went to more monastery and uh, the Virupa of that collection is today in the Nobulinka in Lhasa and it's very clear that it's not only the same donor but also the same workshop that uh, uh, made this uh, a particular uh, set and that the this particular set was probably an, even a notch up higher in quality uh, in relation to the one at Namgel, uh, and maybe even in size, but it's more or less of the same uh, workmanship and quality as the one at Namgel. Another one is very fragmentary. I only know two images uh, in different museums, and that would be a, a third set of of Tsevang Sangpo. And so one one uh, possible scenario is that. He had kind of three sets commissioned, one for Ngor, one for his home monastery, and one probably uh, for the family itself or for the family temple, which would probably would be this one. Uh, while the, the ones uh, in Ngor and well, possibly Ngor Sakya and Namgyal are of the same workshop, the third one definitely is not. And also the, the metal alloy used is differently. And uh, presumably from the fact that the last image in that set is the fourth abbot of Moor, uh, we can, or, or this implies that most of these objects or most of these sets were actually from the time of the fourth abbot and his visit uh, to Mustang. And it's uh, this more abbot who actually died in 12, uh, 1478, I think, in Mustang itself. And before he died there, he gave a lambda initiation to. Uh, more than a thousand people, it is said, uh, according to the literature. And I think this is kind of carried home by these uh, sets of uh, Landry figures in very different uh, styles and workmanship, uh, all ending with the same figure, and so uh, the same uh, Noah Abbott. And so another set is one that Hans Werner Kloe has worked on. And uh, is this gilded set uh, that uh, is donated by a certain uh, Lodrogelzen, which uh, Hans Werner connects with the, the Royal House as well, uh, which is quite a possibility. Uh, another set probably related to the same event uh, is represented through these two bronzes in the private collection. I showed one of them, Mojen, already from that. These have been actually published as portraits uh, of the fourth more abbot in different forms. Uh, that's uh, a kind of slight misreading of the inscription. It seems much rather than that it is commissioned in the memory of the fourth abbot of Moore, and that's uh, written on it. And the actual identity of the depicted is hidden in the first verse. And uh, yeah, the most likely identifications for these two are Sakya Bandita and Moorchen. And so we can, or I would assume that, that these were part of a Lamjay set again, and, uh, that uh, was commissioned under the same circumstances. And so there's a large body of uh, such sculptures from that uh, period. But even in kind of the later period, we'll have uh, interesting examples of sculptures that can be linked uh, across collections. And through this, those cross linkages, 
is also identified and uh, some of the historic context of these figures can be extracted and what's particularly striking in the 17th 18th century how essentially wide the net uh, is, is is thrown kind of in terms of uh, sectarian affiliation uh, one a wonderful image is this uh, kind of papier mache type Im image in uh, Logeka that depicts this uh, an Enigma master of Sikkim who visited uh, Mustang and the royal house, I think in the mid 17th century. So sure, not, not too long before he died. And uh, he's quite distinctive uh, through both his hairdress as well as uh, the, the dress, especially the lower part of the robe uh, that is uh, kind of bound in a particular manner. And uh, an image of the same teacher can be or is in a private collection in Tsarang and has been documented there and published. And uh, the inscription allows the identification of uh, the Logeka figure. Equally, one inscription of uh, the, the three uh, teachers uh, in the uh, Tsarang Palace allows uh, the identify or for the identification of another important uh, historical figure, namely Kato Grigzin uh, Tsevang Norbu, who here joins uh, Sakya teachers otherwise. And there is a kind of inscription on the, on the uh, pedestal. And this allows to actually uh, identify uh, almost in every collection at least one image of Kato Grigzin who not only in Ladakh served as a kind of peacemaker, uh, but obviously in Mustang as well. And in Mustang, they dedicated kind of images to him. And so often what one may at, at first glance uh, simply identify as representations of Padma Sambhava may actually be uh, his representations. Here are two examples that could represent both uh, in in Gumbagang uh, uh, in Lower Mustang. Another kind of fascinating uh, figure is uh, somebody called Mipam Bunzok Sherap, a Drukpa master who was active in Mustang in the late 17th and early. 18th century. And luckily, in the collection of uh, Geling, there was uh, one tanker painting that clarified some of the, the historical context in which uh, this master was active. And on the tanker itself, he's depicted as the root guru of what is identified as Lama Bunzok Tsukien Norbo. Yeah, this Lama Bunzok Tsukia Norbo is actually a prince of the royal house of Mustang, also known as Aham Tsewang, who later uh, left the uh, monastery uh, to marry a Ladakhi queen in the early 18th century. So, so he essentially turned back to, to uh, a secular life. And with a Jukpa teacher being his uh, root guru, we can't be surprised then that uh, kind of objects related uh, to that teacher are found in many, many collections across Mustang, uh, including these uh, representations on tzatzas that are also identified but only in some of them, it's actually readable. That again, uh, uh, distinctive through the hairstyle of the figure and the dress. We can also find him in Logeka itself, uh, which was probably the seat. Logeka, of course, is the oldest, or allegedly oldest Nyingma monastery 
uh, that according to the Pema Katang was founded before Samya Monastery. Yeah, and there's this nice legend that uh, Padmasambhava had to go to Lokekar and uh, create the uh, temple tower there uh, to tame the Naga of the site to be able to found a Samya monastery. Uh, of course, today this Mipam Gunsakshirap is not known and, and uh, the sculptures, uh, the Gonya would uh, identify the sculpture differently. So one of the, the challenges may be to convince them this is not an 11th century theater and, uh, because they think it's the first theater, and, but it is, uh, uh, you know, 18th century or, or late 17th, early 18th century uh, Jogba teacher. But uh, it may help in this respect that the same uh, teacher is also depicted uh, in the old temple in Tsarang. And I was always puzzled by this representation uh, and its context, or, or it's the reason for its presence in the old temple of Tsarang. But once one realizes that here a Jukpa teacher has kind of worked in a Sakya context, uh, this becomes uh, much more clear. So, so in the main uh, niche of that temple, you have the Sakya lineage and just to the side of it, on the main wall, you have uh, Mipam Bindrak Sherab represented which, uh, and so you have real both uh, lineages uh, coming together here, which is a, a, yeah, a fascinating example. Uh, one of the, the interesting questions that probably keep us puzzling for a while is then if you have such an abundance of uh, sculptures, and, but, but at the same time, quite a diversity in different styles, what, what are the implications for, of that? <laughs> and uh, in this connection, I can bring in uh, Lobo Kenshin Sonam Lindop through one of his portraits, and of course, he is by far the most often portrait figure that I know of. <laughs> yeah. And essentially, I think almost every uh, richer family's private temple and definitely every monastery had at least one portrait of Lobo Kenjin in the early uh, 16th, early to mid 16th century <laughs> within their monuments. Yeah. And part, part of that is that he's, of course, uh, the brother of the Mustang king, that he, yeah, and he was a prominent scholar. And so, so in, in that sense, uh, I think together with the local identity uh, that helped to spread his image. And his image itself is interesting, but what interests me here is that many of his portraits are technically quite distinct in the way they are done. Yeah. And the, the one from the Philadelphia Museum actually has an inscription that identifies its artist, a certain Namka truck. And it's distinctive for the inlay work in silver and copper uh, that is extremely fine and that is characteristic of many, many images of uh, Lobo Kenshin across Mustang, uh, especially of, of the larger images, but there are also smaller images like this one in the Rubin Museum that essentially. Uh, still carry the same feature. And so one question here would be, could that, or is that the potential candidate for a style that is actually Mustangi? Is Namkatrak a Mustangi artist uh, of the time? Uh, we know that he worked in uh, Purang as well. 
uh, so it could also be uh, from there. But more broadly, is there any of the different <laughs> styles that were used either for the Lambda set earlier uh, or the uh, different portraits of Lobo Kenshin here? Here's another one from Gami. Is any of these workmen or, or workshops in Mustang, is any of those kind of to be considered local? Yeah. And so, so both the portraits of Lobo Kenshin and uh, the Lambda lineages uh, that date around the late uh, 15th century. So we have late 15th century, early 16th century, uh, both of which were both of such a variety <laughs> that it's, it, it's actually very hard to imagine a scenario how this can come about beyond uh, re the region being extremely rich and engaging workshops all over the region. Yeah, uh, not only, I, I, I doubt that, you know, the traditional scenario that we assume that everything just comes from Kathmandu as it would today, uh, would necessarily work historically. It's definitely something uh, we can, uh, Kind of have to think about and uh, the other question is yeah how do, does one explain these different styles and what is the implication then of those kind of on you know how we more traditionally kind of date uh, sculptures on the basis of style especially for this particular uh, period and of course Lobo Kenshin is also kind of depicted in other materials as uh, this image in uh, Gami Monastery shows. Of the same workmanship as many of the Lobo Kenshin images is uh, this particular portrait in Namgyal. It's one of the larger bronzes. It's in, and it's one of the finest bronzes and only once we kind of helped cleaning away the, the black color on, on the top of the head we realized that the entire hair is actually uh, represented in, in silver. It is also has it also has the same fine uh, inlay work uh, that kind of is characteristic of many of uh, the Lobo Kenshin portraits. And it may very likely, or it is very likely that this is also uh, a person of the royal house, a certain Kanjuk Urza, but uh, yeah, I'm not completely clear about that uh, yet. He's, despite the extremely high quality, he's actually quite uh, very difficult uh, to identify with certainty. The same or, or inlay work of extremely high quality, but of a different type is also used on uh, the set that uh, Tsewang Sangpo commissioned. Here, the representation of Seton Kinrik, and we'll see that the lower vest of uh, the Lama is essentially inlaid in copper. And then we have this kind of uh, inlay of silver across the, the rim of the dress uh, and copper and silver are also used for the eyes and the lips respectively. While uh, the other images, yeah, uh, of Lambda set are distinct, they use the, the, the uh, mercury gilding uh, for the sculptures uh, in both these other sets that are from of the same time, which of course are, are typically of naval workmanship anyway. And so maybe, yeah, hypothetically, one could say maybe these are more likely to be uh, from uh, Kathmandu itself rather than, than all of them. But it's really hypothetically at this stage. And I think I just wanted to bring up the, the, the issue that these this documentation brings uh, once uh, a larger body of uh, these images 
has been or is documented in situ. Here too, in, we have a similar kind of phenomenon of essentially objects found across different collections that are of the same workmanship at different sites or of the same workmen in principle. Uh, like uh, here, the two Buddha images, one in Namgyal, uh, the other one in Logekar, both very, very revered within their context. The one in Logeka obviously kind of more recently cleaned. And what they what what makes them distinctive is yeah, they're they're kind of repose type and they have these these uh, extensive uh, ornamentation at the bottom of the lotus petals that is quite distinctive for them. In this case, I'm not sure if we can say these are probably the ones brought or made by uh, craftsmen, maybe itinerant craftsmen in situ, uh, and other ones, uh, as we find, uh, as this example in Shirtsong, would then be kind of the local imitations of that style or, or the local work uh, or in, in the style that imitates that one. And so that could be one uh, possible scenario for the later period. Here too, we have some really high quality uh, images, uh, especially in, in Song Monastery. Uh, and like here, the Manchushri and Maitreya in dialogue that uh, also very nicely preserved. As uh, kind of the last two examples, I, I now, so, so until now I focused, you know, on, on how these different collections uh, relate to each other and what we gain from it, or also what uh, kind of research questions they pose. Uh, a, a very interesting case are uh, objects that may have belonged together, but are found today in different places <laughs> and obviously then one may ask yeah uh, what like for example if if one finds another image of that set where would one give it if it's <laughs> if if pieces of that set are in, in all uh, the different monasteries and uh, one striking case in that respect is a, a lambre set of which this uh, image of Trakpukpa is one. It's in Gami today, and it's the only one of that set in Gami. Uh, that set is distinctive because a it has a distinctive size. It has a very distinctive, rather reduced style. Uh, also, the the rather white petals. And most importantly, it has inscriptions placed on the, the uh, pedestal that uh, identifies the figure and also its position in the set of the Lambre lineage. Yeah, the, the Chudun, so this is the 17th figure in the set. And it's, it's these characteristics together with, with the donor inscription, uh, of, I have to go back to that of a certain Chamyang Rinchen Gelsen that uh, indicates that, that these are all from the same set. But Gami has only one of them. Yeah? Obviously, they should be at least uh, 20 to 25 um, images. In Tsong, I documented two more of those. And don't be misled by the often very recent painting of these images that change their <laughs> appearance. Uh, this is an image of the same set with the same inscription, both by the same donor and the same identification. And it's here where this Ngojin Gunga Sangpo is that I showed earlier. So, so Tsong Monastery has two sculptures of uh, that particular set. 
uh, and with Murchand, uh, of course, also an important one. Here, his inscription, and he is identified as the uh, 21st figure in this particular set. And then if one uh, kind of, yeah, I expect to find others in the collection. And just yesterday, I just checked my uh, the photographs I have from Philipp Liebermann from uh, Lomandang Chöde Monastery, which I wasn't allowed to document. But it is clear that these two images here are again from the same set, even if I can't uh, read the inscriptions uh, and figure their identity out. It's clear that they are coming from the same set. What makes them appear so different is, of course, the, the cleaning that uh, Luigi Fieni did to all the, the uh, Lomandang uh, images. I think this very strong, uh, yeah, essentially chemical cleaning <laughs> that that uh, these images have un undergone through makes them extremely shiny. Well, actually, that's not possible. Uh, this documentation is earlier than the the potential cleaning, so so I have to take that back. That's not possible. But in any case, it's un it's it's striking that how different they appear. So, so obviously, then there were earlier attempts of cleaning them in contrast uh, to other collections. And then, so, so in this case, we clearly have the case of a divided set. So for some reason, eventually this particular set was divided between monasteries and it must have been a prominent set of sculptures that belonged to one uh, place originally and maybe a likely or a possible scenario would be you know that one private person had it and wanted to give it to different monasteries or something like that and the documentation of course at least would bring them virtually together the other scenario are uh, moved objects uh, or potentially moved objects. An interesting case in that respect are uh, two sculptures by the same donor, one in uh, Kakpeni, uh, the other one in Namgyal. Oh, no, in Gami. One in Gami, one in Namgyal. This one is the Namgyal one. This is the the Gami one, they are both by the donor Chögyong Wangpo. They both depict teachers uh, of the late 14th century. The problem with uh, these particular images, well, there, there are a number of interesting points uh, with these particular images. If that means that uh, these bronzes date to uh, circa 1400, that means that the style of bronze sculpture precedes the Mustang kingdom. Yeah, So, so it essentially stretches uh, the period, which is an interesting question in itself. Then they were probably, you know, just portraits of prominent teachers if they were supposed to be of at the same place originally or given uh, to the same place originally, I don't think we will ever be able to reconstruct. But that they are from the same workshop uh, can be seen from. <laughs> can be seen from the stylistic features, uh, particular the facial features relationship to the ear, but also the quite uh, typical uh, lotus pedestal and also uh, this kind of very high inside the uh, copper plate uh, inside uh, the pedestal. And so I think there's no doubt about uh, that particular aspect of those uh, images. Another interesting case uh, relates to the Prajna Paramita collection, a later Prajna Paramita collection, a, a Jung 
uh, collection in Namgil Monastery, which uh, distinguishes itself by uh, very elaborate uh, covers uh, that are painted on its interior in uh, gold on red. Uh, the first cover, volume K, uh, the top cover has a, a distinctive uh, composition to it, while the others then just show the different uh, Buddhas and then Bodhisattvas that are described in the, the larger versions of the Prajnaparamita, so listed essentially. Uh, and uh, those are in this uh, book covers uh, then kind of identified by inscriptions but do not have distinctive iconographic characteristics. Uh, from a, a student of mine, Isabella Camarotto works on these and has kind of tried to sort uh, them uh, by their depictions. Uh, which are very distinct and the accompanying inscriptions, of course. And uh, in this case, uh, it, during one of the documentation campaigns, we documented this particular cover at Kami Monastery. <laughs> and uh, here it was used as uh, the top cover. It has the, the number 14 and uh, pa. And the bottom cover of that particular book or with the same signature is found in Namgel still. And they are actually stylistically uh, extremely close. And so there is certainly the potential that these again are, were originally together uh, or that the gummy cover originally comes from Namgel it's very, very difficult to be sure about that, uh, simply because these covers are workshop production. And even among those at Namgel, there are different stylistic groups <laughs> that you can differentiate among all these covers. And so arguing on a purely stylistic uh, basis is extremely difficult. And, uh, but if you, see the overview of these kind of golden red covers here that and which ones are actually preserved in Namgel with the book numbers and so on. There is just one, uh, the gummy one actually fits perfectly into the overall uh, kind of succession of the book covers and it is missing in Namgel. And so there, there is quite, uh, uh, a high probability in this case that it may originally come from Namgel. But of course, uh, the big question here is what do we do with this information in the future? Uh, and uh, especially, you know, once we publish that and they find out, uh, they, there could well be uh, an issue uh, in future that when, when I think I have to prepare myself uh, in uh, tackling or in suggesting something in, in future what to do in this case. Maybe there needs to be an exchange of book covers eventually. And so, yeah, so I think uh, these are interesting ways of how these different collections are connected. And obviously you can see there is a huge amount of material and uh, there's a huge amount of further research potential with these collections. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions on those.